Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. I am Jim Miller, the senior pastor here at Grace. Welcome to all who have gathered in person and to all who are joining us online. We are so grateful to have you here this day. We are so honored to have the opportunity to worship with you. To all those who are here, if you would just take a moment and sign the registration book and pass that along to the person beside you. And to those who are joining us online, if you'd just take a moment to put your name in the chat. We just are so thankful to be able to worship with you and serve with you. So much is happening in the life of the church. In just a moment, you're going to be hearing from Reverend Dr. Doug Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis is, was president of Wesley Seminary from 1982 to 2002, served in the Virginia Conference. And Dr. Lewis, I'm just so grateful for your being here today. and We look forward to your, to your time of sharing in just a moment. I wanted to uh, share a couple things with you this morning as we get started. Uh, we're going to be under a little bit different format this morning. Uh, Dr. Lewis is going to be sharing first here. So some folks have stayed from our 8 o'clock service. Thank you for hanging around. You'll be glad you did. We look forward and thank you for being here. And then later in our service, we'll have our children's moment before Sunday school. So uh, parents, if you need to stretch at any point with little ones, our church parlor right here is open and our service can be heard in there as well. But we love having you in here. Our white rose on our altar this morning is in loving memory of Barbara Lima. Uh, Barbara, I learned, was a member, joined this church in 1943, grew up here at Grace, uh, played the organ, played in the bell choir, later uh, moved to uh, Brazil and raised her family and moved back to Brooks Avenue. So just reading about her and learning about her and her time here at Grace growing up, uh, there's just much that we are going to celebrate about her life and her service will be this coming Tuesday morning, 11 o'clock right here in the sanctuary visitation at 10. I also want to say a special note to our youth. We are so thankful for you, and you're such a vital part of our church ministry. Please note that we have a special time for our youth group tonight at 6 o'clock. This is going to be Bishop Easterling. It's going to be joining youth throughout our conference, so our youth, young adults, you're, we'd love to have you. We're going to gather. We're going to have uh, some pizza to give us some energy, and we're going to have our time with the bishop and just really looking forward to this time of sharing. Earlier in the afternoon at 3 o'clock is the first of our confirmation classes. All students currently in the sixth grade through high school, you are welcome to be part of our confirmation journey. If you have questions about this journey, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to belong to the United Methodist Church, these are the kind of questions we'll be dealing with throughout this season. Please let me know if you're planning to attend, and parents, if you have any questions, please reach out to Laura Freeburn or myself. So this morning, we're going to begin with Dr. Lewis, as I said, uh, president of Wesley Seminary. So I've known uh, Dr. Lewis for some time now, and I'm so grateful for his ministry there. Also, the Lewis Center on Church Leadership, which is named in his honor, continues to serve as a vital resource to the local church for all that's happening in the church and the denomination. It's a resource that I go back to time and time again. And so about five years ago, I had the opportunity to reconnect with Dr. Lewis as he was beginning to share about Hooray University and with this special ministry that he's going to be talking about this morning. And as a congregation, uh, we currently sponsor two students at Hooray, and so we're just honored to be in this ministry. And so, Dr. Lewis, welcome. We invite you to share with us. Good morning. Good morning. It's difficult for me to go somewhere and not talk about Wesley Seminary uh, because I did that for many years and I had lots of friends at Asbury Village and in this church. And so it feels like I'm coming back home a bit. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm involved, however, now with a very different institution, uh, Hooray University in uh, Mongolia. How many of you have been to Mongolia? <laughs> it's a long way. Uh, and uh, it, let me, I want to give you just a little background. And this is a map which will give you a picture of where Mongolia is. It's located between China and Russia. It's a fairly large country geographically, though a small country uh, 
uh, uh, uh, population-wise is about three and a half to four million people. But the interesting thing about, one of the interesting things about Mongolia is that in the 12th century, there was a, all these, uh, from all the way the Pacific Ocean through, it was a broad, just uh, flat lands, and was occupied by wandering people in those areas who fought each other and back and forth until a young man named Genghis Khan, you may have heard that word uh, name, Genghis Khan uh, was a genius in terms of military and governmental things and ended up putting together the largest empire ever existed in humankind. All the way from the Pacific Ocean to Eastern Europe was dominated by uh, the, the, his troops and his things and he settled that. It, it, over the years, it disintegrated, but in Russia and China and other places absorbed part of it, but the original country of Mongolia is still there. And there is a, still a statue of Genghis Khan, who is uh, still the hero of this country. And if some of you have a chance to go to Mongolia sometime, you must see this. It's about 100 feet high. You can actually go up into the statue, up into the head, and you look out over this vast plains. But it still reminds us of the history of, uh, of the Mongolian people who are primarily nomadic in things. It's beginning to become more urbanized now as its population moves to the city. And uh, the uh, Korean Methodist Church, about 20 years ago, uh, wanted to help Mongolia to establish itself in, as a country viable for the 21st century. Uh, the, uh, it was part of the Soviet Union, and then in the, when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, Mongolia voted to be a democratic government. And so it's the only democratic government in all of that uh, Asian area. Uh, it also uh, has some resources that it shares, and it is trying to establish itself as a country uh, that both is local but reaches out across the world. And the Methodists uh, from Korea wanted to help start a college there that would help train and prepare the future generation leaders of this country of Mongolia. So that's where the origin of the Hubei University began. Uh, it is a small university now, still about 800 people. Uh, it's people, primarily persons who are coming into the city for the first, uh, in their early parts of their lives, and are trying, we're preparing persons who will be the future leadership of Mongolia, and hopefully help Mongolia become a viable country uh, in this world of ours. Uh, the Mongolia uh, needs future leadership, uh, and uh, that is what Hure is trying to do, and it focuses on science and technology and languages so that it can become an international uh, connection. Um, if uh, it, uh, every summer, they have a festival which is the, uh, celebrating the history of Mongolia. And you'll see there, these are some of the pictures that come from this. There are three things that they do at this period. One is the horses, because horses are a central issue in the history and the future of Mongolia. Uh, they have a horse race. It's 30 miles long. And it's consecutively, you don't make a break. So I remember seeing them ride up to 30 miles. I thought, how will they do that? But they do, because they breed their horses for long distance. And bow and arrow is the chief weapon that they used over the years. And so these are just some pictures to give you an indication of the, of the, the uh, celebration they do of the city every year. Um, primary, about a Third to half of the population is still nomadic. That is, they are moving with their herds 
and they live in small huts called gares. You can see pictures of them in that. Uh, and they all have goats and sheep. Uh, this is the primary way that they maintain their living. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, having dinner one night in a, in, with a family in a, a uh, gare. There were five people living in this gare, grandparents, parents, and a three-year-old grandchild. And uh, she wanted to play with me. She thought it was wonderful having a guest in the thing. But it was a, it was a, great, a great experience for me to see how they live in this. It's interesting, I, the temperature in Mongolia during the winter gets to be about 20 below zero. So I kept wondering how in the world do they stay warm in a gear, but they do. And it's a deciding. And there, of course, they're still roaming uh, there. You can see the herd of goats and so forth, which is how they make their living. Um, the university was begun about 22 years ago. It has three major buildings there and it is still formed by the Korean Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church in the United States has just begun to make some connections with the universities. You're one of the first congregations that's actually providing some scholarship support for students. Do you know what tuition is there? It's $1,000 a year. Now, we think that's not much money. They think it's a lot of money. So, but providing a $1,000 scholarship for a student is a very, very important part because most of them don't have kind of resources. So I appreciate your willingness to reach out of our long distance and affirm this group of persons who will be some of the leaders of that area. So these are the three buildings. This is the picture of their faculty. Uh, many, uh, there are still some Korean missionaries who are part of their faculty. Uh, and uh, the, most of the students there were, are technologically oriented. That seems to be the way that they're learning now, these. And these are some pictures of their classes. You can see the technology that they're using uh, and the various scientific things that they're working on. Uh, the students are very uh, enthusiastic young folk. Uh, I had the, both the obligation and privilege of speaking to them the first time I went there. Uh, they announced to me when I arrived, oh, you're our main speaker for the, uh, uh, this <laughs> conference we're having. I thought, oh, my. But they were very enthusiastic in terms of their reception. Uh, this is, they also have uh, dancing and uh, uh, and also work in languages. Every Every student must take Korean and English as well as Mongolian because they want them to be able to function in the international scene. Uh, they also have another program called the Hot Lunch Program. Since many of these students do not have uh, three square meals as we're used to, they have a lunch program. So for $200 a year, which you make available with the scholarship, they have a hot lunch program. You will see on the tray, that's what you get. And uh, I ate uh, with them, uh, and it was a very delicious food. They're also very interested in athletics and sportsmanship, and they are in currently uh, beginning to build a gymnasium. Uh, you'll see it'll be the, the campus will be, have a gymnasium now. And that's an important building there because in the wintertime, as you say, with the cold weather, they need some inside uh, places to, be, to meet. And here are just some d the Danes of the, of, the, of the new gymnasium that will be. Here is the graduating class for last year uh, in Mongolia. Uh, most of their students will go into uh, immediately there are jobs available for them. This is a, one of the graduates who's a teacher in the local school system, you can see there. And they also are great dancers. Here's the dance group. And this is the, the they're saying, uh, welcoming uh, all of you. 
to Hubei University. So I can promise you that if any of you want to go to Mongolia, yeah, I can arrange a tour for you at the college. They were excited and anxious to make connections with persons from the U.S. Uh, there's been very little contact between uh, the United States and Mongolia, and uh, the churches are helping to reach out and make a connection with students and give them opportunities. So thank you for your interest and support of the students in this university. I can guarantee you they know about Grace Church, that Grace Church cares about them. And I am their representative to thank you, and I'll take back your greetings to them. Thank you for having me this morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, and we just are so grateful to be and to have this connection. Truly, that's being the church. We are grateful. Thank you so much. Now, as we continue in a time of giving God thanks and glory for the ways that we can serve, please join me in our call to worship. Lenten travelers, who is this Jesus that we may follow? Jesus. What kind of Messiah is Jesus? How does it feel to follow a Messiah whose teachings and call are so hard and uncomfortable? Lenten travelers, we are not alone in our feelings about following Jesus as our Messiah. It is a hard road. The blessing is that we do not travel it alone to God that we share this journey with Jesus and one another as we lose our lives for the sake of the gospel to save our lives through Jesus our Messiah. Amen. I invite you to stand with heart and posture as we join in singing our opening hymn, And Are We Yet Alive?
us affirm our faith as we offer together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascendeth into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Thank you. We're going to jump to our children's moment at this time, and so our young ones, you've been very patient. I look forward to our gathering with you, so would all of our children join me up front for this morning's children's message. Good morning, everyone. How are we? It's so good to see you all here. How's everybody doing this morning? I don't know about you. I would love to visit Mongolia, wouldn't you? Seeing the university there, and I just love the connection that we are building, and so grateful. And this is the church, as Dr. Lewis shared, where we are serving and learning from one another. Well, do you recognize what I brought today? That's right. Won't be long, will it? we are celebrating Easter. In fact, that's what we are celebrating this very special season of Lent. Lent is the six weeks prior to Easter. Sort of like remember what we said about Advent, the season before Christmas. It's a special season in and of itself. The word Lent, after all, means spring. Are you looking forward to spring? I am too. I was happy to see spring training started this past week, and a little bit of baseball happening there. I know that excites everybody, right? Well, it does me. <laughs> Very good. good. Now, what do you expect to find in the, an Easter basket? Chocolate? That sounds good. Sure. Yes, that sounds good. Sure. All sorts of candy and good things there. That's right. Now, if I dig a little deeper, in fact, I find some eggs in this basket. Eggs are a sign of new life, aren't they? Baby chicks in this, sure. And that's actually what we're celebrating with Easter, isn't it? The new life that Jesus gives us because of his resurrection means we live, and Jesus lives with us forever. But when I dig deeper in this basket, I find a couple eggs. So let me just take a moment and open them and see. No, it wasn't the jelly beans. Instead, I found a wristband here. This wristband reminds us that Jesus is always with us. Last week when we read about Jesus had to be in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. I can't imagine that, can you? But he knew that God was with him and that made all the difference. So today you'll get a bracelet to keep with you to remind you that Jesus is with you. Also, we read in today's story how Jesus and his disciples he brought them to a deeper understanding of what it means to have him as their Messiah, to be his followers. So this, this one has a rattle to it. What do you think? Jelly beans? I hope not. I'm not eating those during Lent. Uh, goldfish. Again, 
A goldfish is a snack when you're feeling a little empty. That's a good snack to have, isn't it? But also, if we go deeper, the fish was actually a sign for the early Christians. A sign, maybe perhaps Jesus fed with the bread and the fish and the loaves, remember that, or many of his teachings were by the water. And so these fish, goldfish, remind us that when we feel an emptiness, a deep emptiness, I mean, that is a desire for Jesus in our lives, he will fill that. So this week, you get both the wristband reminding you Jesus is always with you, and yes, knowing we need, that need for Jesus is something that will grow, just as you'll grow physically, may that desire to be filled with the love of Jesus always be with you as you serve him, as we support ministries in Mongolia and right here in our own community. Jesus is seeking to work through you. So help us, if you would please get a goldfish, and you're on your way to Sunday school. And again, folks, we love to have little ones with us, and we also have our parlor if you need a place to stretch. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming. This time I invite you to please stand with heart or posture as Sally is going to share with us our gospel lesson for today. Please stand. Good morning, Grace. Can you hear me? Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from the book of Mark, uh, the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 38. And it tells us the story of Jesus meeting with his disciples and the people and explaining to them about the resurrection that would be coming. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, He rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are seeing your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them. I'm sorry, I've lost my place. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes to the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thank you so much. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, so much for sharing the word with us. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather, to worship, to experience the comforts that we are experiencing, for the powerful reminder of what it means to be a connectional church and a church in mission throughout the world. Lord, as we continue to build upon what has been shared this day, we ask that your same Holy Spirit that has inspired work such as it did at Hooray University, your same Holy Spirit will work in this time that all that is said and received will bring honor and glory to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was reading over this text for this morning, This quote from Mark Twain kept coming to mind. You may know it. He once said, Many people are bothered by those passages in Scripture which they cannot understand. But as for me, I always notice that the passages in Scripture which trouble me most are those which I do understand. (laughs) When I reflect on this word, what Jesus is saying is so straightforward. And I think it's such a powerful question that he puts before us and for us to dwell upon this season of Lent. And that question is, what does it look like? What does it mean to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? If we could take that question and carry it with us throughout this season. I pray it will be a season that we do indeed go deeper in our relationship with God. I love how Frederick Buechner once put it. He suggested that after his baptism, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness asking himself the question of what it meant to be Jesus. And that during Lent, Christians are to ask in one way or another what it means to be Christians. What does it mean to you to be a Christian? When we think about this conversation that Jesus was having first with Peter and the rest of his disciples and later the crowd in this text, we see this progression, this going deeper and a deeper challenge that Jesus offers in what it means to be a disciple. If you go just a few verses earlier, And what we shared this morning, Jesus asked his disciples the question, so who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say that you're uh, Elijah or John the Baptist or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. But then we see this conversation continue. It's one thing to intellectually say, yes, I can say who Jesus is. It's another. And it's a greater, and I contend, a more rewarding experience to know and claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life. But that's more than head knowledge. That's heart knowledge as well. Theologian Caroline Lewis put it this way. She said, but there's even more that Jesus is asking in this seemingly straightforward question. And perhaps it's this more that is the most challenging, the most demanding, the more we wish we could avoid. (laughs) Because who do you say that I am is at the same time Who will you say that you are? That's the rub of this question, the heart of its difficulty. 
if we had only had to provide an answer to Jesus' question of his identity, that would be one thing. However, answering the question of Jesus' identity is also having to give voice to our own. Who you say Jesus is, is who you have decided to be. You can't answer Jesus' inquiry without revealing who you are. Or we could switch it around. Who you are reveals who you have decided Jesus to be. <laughs> now, Jesus' question is not a test. It's not about getting the answer right. It's the moment when you come face to face with your own commitment, your own discipleship, your own identity. It's the moment when you have to admit to what extent how you follow Jesus actually connects with some sort of confession of who you believe Jesus to be. We see that confession challenged for Peter. He has his image of who he thinks the Messiah should be. And then Jesus starts talking about how the Messiah is going to suffer and die and rise again. I, I don't even think he heard that rise again part. And Peter begins to object. He says, I, this isn't so. This isn't a Messiah. I'm being scammed here. This isn't what I think a Messiah should be. You see, there have been all those Roman leaders before who claimed to be Messiahs. Bring that, quote, Roman peace only to bring oppression and hurt. Before we think, oh, that's centuries ago, we find in our own lives it's still very easy to be scammed, isn't it? I consider myself an educated person, Wesley graduate, but yet I was telling some just a couple weeks ago how close I came to being scammed. I was paying my bills online, and I saw our Walmart bill, and I read it, and it said we had some reward points. I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just use those points and uh, put them towards our bill. And I clicked on that, and it said my Walmart card had been compromised and gave me the number to call. I did. They said, oh, yes, there's been thousands of dollars charged to your account, and we can't give you reward points. We've got to straighten this out, so we need you to download this app. Well, that's when the red flag started. I said, no, I think maybe I'll call the security myself. And I called the number they gave me only to get the same individuals again that were trying to scam me in that time. And so I didn't. And later contacted Capital One. There was no charge to my account and everything was fine, but I came that close. And they say it's not just those of us who are older, but young folk as well. Scam. We live with that kind of defense that we're hesitant to say yes to a Messiah who promises to lead us, but his journey means suffering, means the cross, it doesn't mean military rule or might. Well, when Peter hears this, he rebukes what Jesus is saying. And that's the point. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind, but human thinking. And he rebuked Peter. Now, there's a lot of rebuking going on in this text. And uh, that's not a very pleasant word, is it? But I came across this definition. To rebuke is to confront and to condemn with the purpose of effecting radical change. You see? Jesus was about bringing radical change, transformation, not for us to suffer under the false messiahs of this world that bring harm, that bring oppression, that put you down, that say you're not loved, that say you're not valued, that say you're not included. No. Effecting radical change means lives are being transformed in Mongolia, and right here in Gaithersburg, Maryland, God's Holy Spirit continues to work. Peter, he wanted to define how a Messiah should act and lead. Verses following. And so let us, 
catch ourselves. In those moments, we even fool ourselves thinking we know what's best for God and God's ways. When we have the one who promises to lead us, who meets us right where we're at. Such a joy to have my daughter Rebecca here today. You've been praying for her as she came through surgery in this time of recovery well. And I know she's thanking you and it's so good to see her resuming her activities of chasing little ones, my grandchildren around. And so we're so grateful for answered prayer. We decided we would, uh, since she was off work yet, we would take some time and we'd go down to the ocean for a night. So I worked out that we would have this nice hotel and I found it and I was telling my wife Betsy about it and I said, and I found this hotel and yes, it has an indoor pool for kids and so she looked at me and she said, you know, they're going to want you to go swimming, don't you? Now I confess, I do not like swimming. Now I know many of you do. Gwen, if you're listening, I know you taught swimming, and, and it's a wonderful exercise. It's probably the best exercise there is when you stop and think about it. But for whatever reason, I, I love the water, seeing the ocean, being around it, but don't ask me to go in it. But I said, okay, I will do that, and packed my bathing suit, and the time came, and the kids, yes, they were excited and couldn't wait to go down to the pool, and so I made that journey with them. This nice hotel, but I don't know whoever designed it, that they would design having a swimming pool right there beside the restaurant. And there was no wall in between them. Just this plexiglass little wall there to keep people from being splashed, I guess. And so there we were. I was already uneasy about the whole, I know how to swim, but not going. And now here are all these people dining. I'm going to have this audience I looked at my son-in-law and just shook my head, and he laughed at me, and then I said to him, I'm not going to worry about it. We don't know any of these people. I'm never going to to see them again. And so I I went into the pool with the grandchildren. But, you know, I look back at that. Here I am, 63 years old, and I'm still worried about what other people think. (laughs) When will I reach that point? but I'm so glad I didn't let it keep me from doing what I said I was going to do. When we think about being disciples, when we say that we are going to follow Jesus, do we let what other people think get in the way of the living out of our commitment? I'm glad I didn't give in to those inhibitions I'm glad my grandchildren perhaps will have that memory. Yes, he got in the pool with us. He swam with us. He just didn't stand on the side saying, oh, you need to do it this way or that way or a way to go, but was there with us. Isn't that the church? We're not called to just be standing on the sidelines saying, this is what you should be doing. This is what you shouldn't be doing. Oh, good job. No, we are to be in the community. To truly be a neighbor is to swim with, walk with, help those Here was Jesus who was willing to suffer on our behalf. What does it mean for us to take up the cross? Our willingness to suffer, that is to reach out to those who are suffering from lack of food, housing, who have been oppressed, excluded. My youngest daughter, now 22, called me last evening and said, Dad, I'm alone at a gas station pumping gas, so I just needed somebody to talk to, uh, make me feel safer. I said, that's wonderful. You call me anytime. And she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I was practicing my sermon, and I mentioned I was talking about that swimming pool. I said, do you remember being, oh, yes, I remember going to that. She said, uh, and she took me back to a time when I went with our youth to a rock gathering in Ocean City, and Lauren at that time was too young to go to rock, so she stayed back at that pool and uh, with my wife Betsy. She said, you know, Dad, I never told you what happened. Don't you love it when your children now as adults tell you something <laughs> that happened when they, were, that they didn't tell you then? So she said, you see, I was swimming at that pool and uh, I was throwing this tennis ball and Mom was there with me and back and forth and other toys, but when Mom wasn't looking, I threw the ball really hard against that plexiglass wall Oh, I missed the wall and it went right into the restaurant, and I heard some dishes breaking. Mom didn't see it, so all I said to my mom, we got to go. I need to go back up to the room right now, and so we left. I said, I, I never told you what happened in that time. I 
experienced a joy, a fun story I wouldn't have heard if I hadn't been willing to swim, if I hadn't been willing to get in the pool. When we are not willing to jump in, to serve Christ and walk with him, we miss out on the powerful stories of lives being transformed, of somebody making their commitment to Christ or recommitting their life to Christ. We miss the stories of somebody who has given up thinking nobody could ever love them or they could ever be forgiven of their sin, finally realizing they are loved, they are a beloved child of God, and God has a plan for their life. Oh, what stories we miss out when we think that the church's heyday or yesterday, that we don't have a role to play in the community today. We have a story to tell because Jesus is here and is guiding us and is journeying with us this very moment. So if you want to save your life, you'll lose it you lose your life, you will save it. That is, when we stop living to ourself or asking God to be the Messiah, we think God should be. Instead, say, here am I. Powerful doors open. Stories are formed and told and retold. And another will bring joy to someone who's hurting. The gospel account continues to unfold. So as we journeyed back from the ocean, I saw signs for the Harriet Tubman Museum Memorial in Cambridge. I had to be back, so I couldn't stop, but I'm determined I'm going to stop there next time. I loved what Harvard Stevens had to say about Harriet Tubman. I love the title of his article, Lead, Follow, or Get Out of the Way, which is called a discipleship. He wrote, Harriet Tubman was a brave woman who escaped slavery during the Civil War. Despite a huge reward for her capture, she returned to the slaveholding states over 19 times to lead hundreds of African Americans out of slavery's clutches into territory where they could live with liberty. Harriet Tubman was a Christian, and she became a great warrior in the battle to dismantle the cruel institution of slavery. When asked about the source of a fearless strength, she would always say, It wasn't me. It was the Lord. I always told him, I trust you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me. And he always did. Harriet Tubman, the black Moses, was never captured. And there are countless stories like these, and new stories are being told daily. They are the stories of Christian people who learn to lead because they keep rediscovering what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Doing so reminds us that the first call Jesus made to others was not to be apostles or to be ordained or even to be members in the church, but simply be his disciples, taking responsibility for going on their own journeys of faith with the living God, just as he was doing in his own way. It is difficult teaching. Discipleship involves giving up our own lives through sacrificial love, leading to the surprising and ultimately saving discovery that in giving we have received. What joy have you received? How has God blessed you? How might you give back? What ministries like Hooray? What ministries here at Grace in our community is God calling you to be part of? to walk beside, to swim with, to journey together. This morning, let us renew our covenant to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to once again follow him, not try to lead him. At the beginning of the year, John Wesley would offer a covenant service, and part of that service was this covenant prayer. I think of Lent as a time of new beginning for us as Christians. And so I'd like to finish by inviting you to offer with me what is known as John Wesley's Covenant Prayer. Let us pray together. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. 
I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. And so with thanksgiving in our hearts, we take this time to present our offering unto the Lord, and our offertory will be offered by Justin Bonham. And Trevor.
Let us pray. God of boundless goodness, we have come to this place this day to worship you with our songs, with our words, with our gifts, and with our whole hearts. We are reminded that our discipleship decision involves more than what we bring this day to the altar. It calls us to a place where a cross that is ours alone must be picked up and carried. This, more than anything else, is why we need the community of your church. Strengthen us, we pray, not just to carry our own cross, but to help sisters and brothers carry their crosses as well. In the name of the one who bore his cross for us. Amen. Please be seated. As we go into prayer this morning, we want to uplift our joys. And again, I just want to say what a joy it is, Dr. Lewis, to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for your sharing and inspiring word and for the opportunity for us to continue to be in connection with Hooray University. I also want to share the joy, and we're going to celebrate it next time Deacon Helen is with us. I sit on the Board of Ordained Ministry, and we had our exams this past week, and Deacon Helen passed, which is no surprise to me or to any of us, but she will be ordained full deacon this coming annual conference. So congratulations, Deacon Helen, to a journey well done to be in full connection. We are so grateful for her ministry amongst us. So with the joys that we celebrate, with the concerns that are heavy upon our hearts this day, let us go to prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for that powerful message that Justin and Trevor just brought us. There was Jesus. There's never been a time, there's never been a moment that you have not been there for us. As we confess, there have been times we have not been there for you. But what we know in this time is that we are forgiven. And because of you, because of your gift of salvation, you bring fulfillment to each of our lives that no other, quote, God could ever bring. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in your work in this world. To the students and faculty of Hooray University, for the Korean missionaries who first planted these seeds of hope and to see them coming to fruition, thank you. Thank you for Dr. Lewis and for all who have made known to us these opportunities to be in ministry with the community of Hooray. Thank you for our opportunity to be the church right here in Gaithersburg, and to be part of this annual conference. Lord, we pray that each day will be open to your leading. The familiar hymn we heard played on the carol on this morning, where you lead, I will follow. May that be the promise that flows from each of our hearts. May we stop trying to direct you and how it should be done and how and when we'll answer your call. Instead, Lord, we, like Peter, get behind you and know you will lead us, trusting you that you will lead the way. For all that you've done, we thank you. For all that you're doing in the life of this church and through us, we praise you. For the needs that we carry in our hearts, we surrender these to you. In situations that seem all so overwhelming, where we become so weighed down when hearing the news, we are reminded you are still God. And you will bring us to that time when all will be overcome, when you will complete your good work for the work that remains, for the task that you call us to as a congregation. We surrender our hearts, our lives to you. Our journey doesn't stop when we're baptized, when we're ordained, when we retire or complete a position in the church. 
you always have that next chapter in mind. Lord, may we be open and willing to follow. And now we offer the prayer together that you have given us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand with heart or posture as we join in singing our closing hymn, Forth in Thy Name, O Lord. Please be seated. Thank you. So as we begin a new week, I give you these challenges. I invite you to reflect on the scenario of Jesus asking you, who do you say that I am? Secondly, what key teaching about discipleship have you discovered this Lenten season? Pray for such a discovery. Lastly, I invite you to use John Wesley's covenant prayer. You can Google it and you'll find it. Use this prayer throughout the season of Lent. Ask yourself, in what ways do you sometimes argue with Jesus' priorities and values? Why? And what helps you stop? Now as we go forth, beloved, go from this place in the love and power of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to meet your neighbors and yourself with an open heart as we take up our cross and follow Jesus for the sake of the gospel. Amen.